Sister Eastman and Jason Ray and his family before we, uh, we really proceed. Um, it's kind of a heartache. Um, he had talked to me a few times about his sister and trying to reach her and uh, um, just couldn't do it. But anyway, um, God is good and uh, he's always available to us. Um, all we need to do is make ourselves available to him. And I want to, uh, I want to, this morning I'm, go I'm going to continue on what we started last week, and I don't know how far we'll get. Uh, I haven't really figured out how long I want to really, um, I want this to go. Uh, I, I don't care how long it goes, to be honest with you. I don't care if I teach it for, for about three years. Um, the, uh, there's something lacking in Christianity today. And that is the desire of heaven. Even, even talking about heaven is lacking in Christianity. Christianity has entered this, this sphere, if you will, of, of let's, let's, all just, let, let's all just have a wonderful, awesome life now because we have nothing to look forward to. And uh, the scripture is obviously opposed to that. Not having a good life, but... Uh, but lacking hope. Um, the scripture is all about giving us hope for heaven because this world is a burden and it's not, it's not something that we should be disdained by and we should be, uh, we, we should say, oh, I just can't do anything. God wants us to do our very best, but he doesn't want us to lose focus of eternity. Um, we, we, we mentioned it last week that th this whole earth thing, it's just a, a life cycle. That's all it is. We're born, we live, we die. We born, we're, we bo we're born, we live, we die. It's just a life cycle. All of the, everything on earth is a life cycle. In heaven, nothing is a life cycle. It's eternal. And that is why so many people can't seem to grasp it is because we are so involved and burdened and overwhelmed by a life cycle here on earth. We're born, we struggle, we, we fight through this, we climb through that, we climb ladders and we drop off of ladders and we, we do our dead level best to try to leave something for the next generation and, and, and all that happens and all that's supposed to happen, but then we die. And we have our mind made up that... It's final, it's final, it's final. Earth is final for us at that point. Well, we're either going to go to heaven or hell. And the church has stopped talking about heaven as a place to go. And they've tried to get heaven on earth. And the church has also stopped talking about hell as a place to avoid. And so Christianity is just a little bit mixed up and, and we're racing right close to the end where Jesus is coming soon. And I don't want anybody to miss out because we're so overwhelmed by this life and all of the things that are going on and our schedules are busy and, and everything. We, we've got, so we, we make more important things uh, Monday through Friday through Saturday and even on Sundays. We, we set everything else as far more important than heaven. And I think the Lord is just kind of looking at us saying, hello, I'm still here. My salvation is still available. So we're going to go back to the book of Revelation today and we're going to just kind of go through few different things. We're talking about the seven wonders of heaven. Last week we started, we, we got through the first wonder, and that is that it exists. That's a wonder in and of itself, just that heaven exists. And we got through the second wonder, and that is that heaven is a place of perfection. 
something all of us strive to be, but none of us can attain. But God has attained it because He created it perfect. And we're gonna we're gonna start with the third wonder of heaven this morning. But uh, if we get us all to, if we can just all stand again, and uh, <clears throat> we want to go to the Lord in prayer. I want to pray for Jason Ray and his family, and uh, and also for Sister Eastman, who's not here. She's um, many many of you know that she has not had a very good diagnosis, and she's um, she's not feeling too well this morning. But we want to pray for her that God would just continue to touch her. Father, we give you glory and honor today, and we thank you. Thank you. We can all be in your house. Thank you that we can be in your presence. Jesus, I pray for a healing, healing across the sanctuary here, Lord. Pray, God, that you would just give me a healing touch today, Father. And I pray that you would uh, continue to heal Sister Jerry Joe and continue to heal Sister Boyd. And I pray, Father, that you would touch Jason Ray and his family. Lord, they're hurting today. You know exactly what's going on. They're hurting. They're broken. They're confused. They don't know which way to turn, what to do right now. They don't know how to, how to proceed, um, have, having, been, having had all of this in their family for so long, and now all of a sudden it's gone, and, but the pain is, is, is increased, Lord. Sister Eastman needs a touch today. Father, and I give you all glory and praise, and I ask you that you would lead and guide this Bible study ask you to lead and guide us, give you praise. God, I thank you. I thank you so much. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. And everyone said in Jesus' name. Praise God. Can we just clap our hands to the Lord or give him some praise? He's so worthy. Oh, God, you're worthy. Oh, God, you're worthy. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. God is good. Amen? Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing for, uh, for prayer. Um, we're going we're gonna to start with the third wonder of heaven this morning. And, and, and forgive me for Bible school, but I love it. <clears throat> I, I enjoy Bible school. So, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's always good to, to go into the scripture. Amen? And to, and to read it and to study it a little bit. Uh, we're, in, we're in Revelation 21. I'm going to read 15 through 17. Uh, it says, And he talked with me, and he that talked with me, rather, had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length, of it, length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth of the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. The, the third wonder that I want to point out this morning is the size of heaven. It's incredible size. Oftentimes we, 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 we read about this and because it's King James and it's four square and length and the breadth and the, the reed and 12,000 furlongs and all because we, because we don't use the same things to measure today. We just read over it, just glance over and say, whoa, that's cool. And we just keep going. Now, I, I grew up in a country where furlongs was still a, a, a thing that people talked about. We didn't use furlongs, but, you know, we talked. It was part of the vocabulary, but it wasn't, we didn't measure with furlongs. <clears throat> but when you start measuring agriculture and you start measuring land and stuff like that, furlongs gets to be uh, something that's used because it is just, you know, sometimes it's just a little bit bigger than a mile. And, and uh, instead of talking about miles, you, you, you bring that out just a little further. Cubits. We don't really measure with cubits anymore. There are two cubits. One of them's 18 inches and one's 21 inches. That's generally measured from the tip of your 
finger here to your elbow. Fairly accurate. Some people have an 18 inch cubit, some people have a 21 inch cubit. It says the using the measure of a man that is of the angel. Now, uh, he was referring to the pastor there, and so um, that, that would be who, whoever, who, whoever that was, but possibly, quite possibly, it was John that he was referring to. Um, but, uh, but we don't know that for sure. Because angels don't have bodies, so they don't have cubits. They don't have arms to measure anything from. Um, so according to John, heaven's laid out in a perfect cube. To so bring that into today's um, measurements, it's 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles wide, and 1,400 miles high. Nearly 2 million square miles just in the width and the length of it. Two million square miles. Kind of give you a comparison. New York City is 305 square miles. So how many New York cities would fit inside, right? But if heaven was laid out in stories, each story... If it was 100 miles high, which generally a story in a building is about 10 feet. But every 10 feet is a story. So if you're looking at a four-story building, you're looking at approximately 40 feet from the ground floor to the top plate before the trusses are put on. If you're looking at a three-story, you're looking at about 30 feet from the ground floor to the top plate, uh, just to kind of give you an idea. But if, if it was laid out in stories that were the, each was 100 miles high, it would be 1,400 stories or 1,400 floors, if you will, that would each be 1.96 million square miles. A little little big. Approximately, there's about 8.4 million people somewhere in New York City living within 305 square miles. About 8.4 million in New York City, approximately. Yeah, that number goes up and down, obviously. About every 10 years, they do a census, and nobody even knows who it is, because I never answer the door when they come do my census. I'm probably one of those 2.5 people, which, you know. Um. So New York City and every one of its inhabitants can fit inside of one level or one story of heaven 6,500 times. 6,500 New York cities and all of us inhabitants can fit within one story of heaven. And if they're a hundred story or a hundred feet high, that's fourteen hundred. That leaves thirteen hundred and ninety-nine stories left. It's about fifty-four point six billion. Per level, per story, or per level rather. Surrounding this massive cube is a wall about 200 feet thick. I'd feel safe and secure behind a wall of jasper 200 feet thick. I can't remember how thick the uh, the wall, the Great Wall of China is. I can't remember. I, I looked at that one time, and probably many times, and forgot every time I looked at it. But one of the greatest wonders of heaven is its incredible size. Oftentimes, we 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 tend to 
we, we tend to just think of 1,400 square miles and we don't, we, we don't understand what 1,400 square miles really is. Now, I grew up with, with a lot of times everything was one square mile, 640 acres, one square mile. It was pretty easy where I grew up because you didn't, you, we didn't have road signs. We just had you go down three miles and every mile there was a road that went through, made it nice and easy. Flying over Iowa is pretty cool because you can, you, you can pretty much figure out everything and, and uh, it's, it's just a simple mapping, easy mapping situation and you can, you can figure out your way around because you just, you, you know where these miles, this mile intersects with that mile and intersects with the ma that mile, intersects with that mile and, and it makes it nice and simple and easy. <clears throat> and, but, uh, but you get into the city and you, and, 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 and you can't really figure out what a mile is because, because everything is, you know, by a city block and this and that and the other. And sometimes it's two, uh, it, it, one block has, has 200 um, numbers in it. It's, it's doubled, it's a double block and, and it goes from 100 to 200 in each block instead of a 100 block and a 200 block. You got a 1 and 200 block and a three and four hundred block. There's a lot of neighborhoods like that in La Crosse and you want to just burn them down because none of them makes sense. But, <clears throat> but the size, the, the, the size of, of heaven, just the size that, the, that John was given, it, it doesn't make it <clears throat> a, a small place at all. It doesn't make it very small. Makes it pretty large, actually. <clears throat> now, the, so we we see that this that the size of heaven is a wonder. It it really is a wonder because because we we just you now we read it in the scripture. Oh, yeah, it's got furlongs and it's got cubits and it's got this and that and the other. And okay, it's it, it, in our mind we make it about this big. You know, it fits on a couple lines in the Bible. You know, just about that, about that size. But when we actually break it down, how many of you here have been to the ark? Went to the ark. Three, four. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people went to the ark and, and, and they came back and asked me, is it really that big? They made it the size of that the scripture says, yeah. And everybody's just amazed by the size of the ark. It's kind of it, it's it kind of goes along with when we read stuff in the scripture until we actually get our eyes on it and we actually see it and we can actually stand there. We really don't understand the immensity of it because it fits in just a couple of lines in, in a book, right? It, it really goes to show you how our imaginations are either way big or way small based on our experiences. Our imaginations are completely dictated by our experiences. If we have small experiences, we have small imaginations. If we have incredible experiences, then we have incredible imaginations. You know, a lot of times when we were over in, in Jerusalem, especially, and they, they, they stood us right by the, the, the wall. I don't know if, if, if Sister Jerry Joe and Brother Jeff, you remember this or not, but uh, how big those stones were that, that were in that wall. You know, and, until you're there and you actually see them, you know, we see, we see Sunday school literature and stuff where it's got a little picture drawn in there. Until you're actually standing there and you see the size of that stone that they built that mountain up with, it's like, wow, that's a hunk of rock. And a lot of times you, you don't really recognize the immensity of those things until you're actually experiencing them. 
So quite a few people came back from the ark and said, that is amazing. I can't believe the size of it. I can't believe how huge that thing is and how big that is. And what'd you think it was, a kayak? I mean, it's not just this little canoe, you know? It's, it's, it's a boat. It's a big boat. And so I think heaven is like that too. I think we're, we, we, we get to see and we can, we, we can figure out in today's measurements how long, how wide, how big, and everything it is. But, but until we experience it, we're just really not going to have a clue. We're going to have to get there. Because people have, people have talked about how big the ark was and we, we've laid it out and said, all right, here's, here's how many feet it is and this and that and the other. But until you're standing there looking up at the thing and looking down the wall of it and you're wondering, wow, that's a big boat. In today's Christianity, people's Christian experience with Jesus is very small. And therefore, their imagination is small. Therefore, because they have a small experience, they have a small imagination, and they have a very small hope. One thing that I would like to try to accomplish is that your experience gets bigger. Amen? And that our hope gets bigger so that when we get to heaven, we're not just kind of standing like, ah, I had no idea. And then we're told, depart. Depart. Because we never made heaven a big deal. We need to be making heaven a big deal. We're trying to make we're we're trying to make our jobs a big deal. We're trying to make our retirement plans a big deal. We're trying to make our homes a big deal. We're trying to make our vehicles a big deal. When are we gonna make Jesus a big deal again? When are we going to make heaven a big deal again? Amen? Until Christianity makes heaven a big deal again, they're going to shortchange themselves on the meager things of earth. The life cycle. Get as much as I can. Do as much as I can because this is all going to end. Here, how about do as much as you can, get as much as you can, but make sure that Jesus is the focus in it all. Amen? This is the earnest of our inheritance. Until Jesus becomes a big deal to us again, until heaven becomes a big deal to us again, Life is going to be too big of a deal. And the Bible tells us it's but a vapor. It goes away so quickly. We bury people way too early. They can be 100 years old, and we think that's a pretty awesome long time, but it's not very long. And the grand scheme of things it's not very long we are already at the point where many of the many of the conveniences that we have are a hundred years old something something I, I I, I was just listening to something the other day, and I can't. I, 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 they, they had their 100th birthday, and I'm like, 100 years, really, already? I remember that that seemed like it was in its infancy when I was a kid. Well, it was 50 years old then. <laughs> the 
the incredible size of heaven. I think it's a pretty amazing thing for us to continue reading it so that our imaginations expand. I'm not talking about vain imaginations that we're just imagining things that aren't there. I'm talking about being able to visualize the size of it. If we can visualize the, the, the size of heaven that God has prepared for us, maybe things of the earth will grow dim again. Maybe we'll realize that this is really just a speck of dirt out in the middle of a universe. The fourth wonder of heaven. <clears throat> Verses 11 through 14 of Revelation 21. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels the names and names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel on the east three gates on the north three gates on the south three gates on the west three gates and on the wall and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb Drop down to verse 18. And the building of the wall and of its and, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. Made it through all those. <clears throat> and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Can you see it? Can you, can you just kind of see it? That this fourth wonder is its incredible beauty. It's incredible beauty. Now, now we, we talked last week, we talked about different, uh, the, the seven wonders of the world and, and different things. And, and uh, uh, one of the original wonders of the world was uh, what was the hanging gardens of Babylon. Bab Babylon had, um, had this, the, the city of Babylon, and there's still some, some remains and stuff there uh, today that, that show the, the, the real dark, um, I don't even know what color blue it would be, but it's a, it's a blue that, the, that was built uh, in, into the city and, the, and there was different things that had that blue on it. Uh, so Babylon was known for, um, let's go conquer a nation and let's, and let's march uh, different ones from that nation. Let's march them all the way across the desert and and. And let's let make sure that we take them up to different high places so that they can see the city of Babylon and all of its splendor and all of its glory. And, and, and so we can, and they use, they, they built the city not for their benefit. They built the city for the intimidation of their enemies. They wanted to intimidate their enemies. The, the hanging gardens were built for the queen, but... You know, anyway, so the, uh, but, but Babylon was, was all built up to try to intimidate the enemies of Babylon. And they would march them, sometimes they would march them uh, around all kinds of different ways to try to get the best point of view so that they could start to sing and start to chant and start to get excited about their city while their newfound slaves were marching towards the city. And they used it. They used it to try to break down uh, the pride and break down the the, the strength of their uh, of their new captives, if you will. 
And, and so they, they did that with the children of Israel, and they did that with the children of Judah. And, and so they, they, they brought them, brought them this, through these ways to try to portray. Uh, and, and it was Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these, these four princes, if you will, that, that they're the only ones that, that we really read about. These four princes that did not get impressed by Babylon. We, we see that they weren't impressed at all. Of course, later on, we see Nehemiah was there, and we see Ezra was there, and uh, some of the other, and, and thousands that were released from there to, to go back to um, Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And then uh, in Nehemiah, there's thousands more that went back to rebuild the, the walls around Jerusalem. So we see, we, we see historically, we see a lot of things going on there that, uh, and, and they, they weren't impressed by Babylon much at all. They really weren't. But the world was very impressed by Babylon. The world, in fact, was so impressed by Babylon that we still have cultures today that are trying to mimic Babylon. They're trying to mimic that and try to, and they're trying to build their empires and their kingdoms based on Babylonian principles of trying to intimidate others. We want to show that we have power. We want to show that we have splendor. And we want to show that we have majesty. And, and we want to show all of that so that others are intimidated. Because nobody just said, hey, I want to go live in Babylon. No, they had, to, they had to go out and they had to conquer nations. And they had to enslave people to come live in Babylon. Because the only ones that wanted to live in Babylon were Babylonians themselves. But here's the crazy thing about that. After they had been in Babylon a while, they started to enjoy Babylon. In both Nehemiah and Ezra, we read about the ones that wanted to stay there. They wanted to stay there. Now, we, if, if you kind of do a little bit of a timeline, they were people that were born in Babylon. They weren't people who were um, captives, if you will. They, they were captives. They were born in captivity, kind of like the, Egypt, the, the, the children of Israel that were born in Egypt. They didn't know any better. They, they, they always wanted to be delivered, always wanted to be delivered, always wanted to be delivered. For 420 years, we want to be delivered. We're going to be delivered. We're going to be delivered. And then all of a sudden, they're out in the desert, and they say, hey, uh, we, we'd like to go back. There was, you know, garlic and leeks and food back there. We want to go back. We, we want to go back to getting beat. We want to go back to being slaves. We want to go back to, to, to that kind of a lifestyle where, where, where we'd, we'd rather be a slave and have food to eat than be free and only have manna. The dingbats didn't even know that manna was temporary. They didn't even realize it. Because they were caught in this, in this desert, they didn't realize that the promised land was, was not very far away. It really wasn't that far away. When you watch how they wandered around in the wilderness... They were only a day or two away from the promised land. 
a day or two away from, from living in houses that they never built, drinking from wells that they never dug, eating from crops that they never had to plant. They were only a day or two away, but they were caught wandering in their mind and they're shortcutted and shortchanged in their mind and they just couldn't get past the flavors of Egypt. Babylon was the same way. They, they wanted to go back to Jerusalem. They wanted to go back to worship in their God. They wanted to go back to their temple. They wanted to go back to their city. They wanted to go back to their land. They wanted to go back to all of that in, in their mind. And they, they'd sit around and they'd talk about, how, oh, I want to go back. I just want to go back. I want to go, I want to go to where, the, where my heritage is. I just want to go back to where my heritage is. I want to just go back. I want, I want to see the temple. I want, to, I want to stand on Temple Mount. I want to go where Abraham walked. I want to go where, where all of that was. And in their mind, they talk about and they talk about and they talk about but they're so caught up in the here and now of Babylon that they just couldn't make the journey across the desert to get home it took them three months it took them three months from the time they left Babylon until they entered Jerusalem it was a three-month journey. Think about that for just a moment. In three months' time, everything would change. Their lives would be completely new. In three months' time, they would, they would have so much distance between them and Babylon Three months caused them incredible fear, enough to keep them in bondage. This is July. It wasn't January like just a few days ago? Think about how fast time goes. And the older you get, the faster it goes. Now, when you're a kid, you, you think one year in school is, is a 25-year is a prison sentence each year. You just can't get past, oh, I can't get through this, I can't get through this, I can't get through this. When, <clears throat> when you get older, you're thinking, my, they just started school. How are they out already? But, you know, it, the younger we are, it just seems like it takes forever and ever and ever. But the older we are, it's like, wow, that went fast. Think about how fast three months goes. Looks like a long time on the calendar. On the calendar, it looks, oh, yeah, I've got, whew, I got three months. Oh, that goes so quick. In fact, if you're not planning about three months out on things, you're, you're probably not going to get plans made. But this incredible beauty, it, 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 took, it, it, it took three months to, to, to get to Babylon. It took three months to get back to Jerusalem. Babylon was this was was the um, when Solomon's temple all the gold was scraped off the walls. Babylon was the last thing of beauty left on earth. Nobody could point to anything with more splendor than Babylon. Because Solomon's temple, which was the thing with the most splendor. Could you imagine having your walls were gold? Just melted it and just smeared it on like it was plaster. And then they polished it and silver and all the things that you walk in. 
You walk in, it's not gold paint, it's gold. And they scraped all that off and hauled it to Babylon. And they didn't even use it in Babylon. They didn't use it in their city. They liked the blue colors and stuff. They, they liked the stone and the blue colors and, and, and all of the gold and the silver and everything. Just, it, that was just money for them. They didn't, they, they didn't build with it. But Solomon said, gold and silver is nothing. I'll just smear it on the walls. But the beauty that, that heaven's going to be God created heaven to be a place of incredible beauty. It will not be anything. Uh, Babylon won't compare to any of it. God creates it really beyond description. I mean, John describes it, but can you picture it? Your picture's probably, probably tabletop model size, isn't it? Because that's who we are. We take the things of God and shrink them down to make them man-sized. We right-size them to us, to our perspective, instead of leaving them God-sized. The Bible tells us that we're created in the image of God. Not that God has created the image of us. The problem with Christianity is that we are trying to man-size the things of God. We're trying to take the things of God and we're trying to, we're, we're trying to boil them down to a tabletop model. Something that's bright and shiny and, and we can talk to everybody about. But we don't experience ourselves. We're not praying God-sized prayers. We're praying, now I lay me down to sleep prayers. We're praying, God, get me through tomorrow prayers. We're not praying big things. We're praying little tiny things that, that, that I, I think frustrate God because he's sitting there saying, can anybody see me for who I am and for what I am and for the size I am? Why are you trying to make me tabletop size? I'm God-sized. I fill all space. And you're trying to make me a trinket. Because of that, heaven's not our hope anymore. We just want heaven to be right here on earth. We want everything, everything nice here on earth. The crazy thing is, this is all going to burn up. None of it matters to God. He created us to, to have dominion on earth. He didn't create earth for himself. He created us for himself. And we're trying to make a big deal out of earth when earth is a speck of dust. Anything God creates is beautiful way beyond our description. We can, we can try to describe it, but really in the end, um, we, we, we can only describe it to the, to the size of model that we are comfortable with. We can't see it for what it truly is. The sun, the moon, the stars, the sky, they, they declare the glory of the Lord. Uh, the mighty oceans, <clears throat> the, the winding rivers, the majestic mountains, the green valleys, the, the rainbow in the sky after a drenching spring rain or a blanket of fresh fallen snow. All these things are just, uh, they're, they're, they're gorgeous and they're beautiful and they're wonderful and we, we stand in awe by them.
And yet, we make God a tabletop model. Our finite minds, they're complex to one another. <laughs> to, to each other, our minds are very complex. But to God, our minds are nothing. They're finite. We, can, we, we cannot begin to comprehend how beautiful heaven truly is going to be. What John is describing is, is a place that's glistening. It's brilliant in color. It's, it's the, it, we, he, he were looking at the most luxurious piece of jewelry that we had ever, ever, ever possibly seen. In verse 11, John describes the overall beauty of heaven as being like jasper that's clear as crystal. Um, <clears throat> The, the Greek word for jasper here refers to a completely clear diamond with the brilliant light of God's radiant glory that's shining out of it. Um, mo most of the time, we think of a diamond as, as light has to go through and refract and, and go through like that. But, but the jasper stone here is a light that's an internal light that's shining out of it, not shining through it. It's a light that's internal, and it shines out of it. Well, we already know that the Lord is that light, and, uh, and so we, we, we already understand He's the light that's inside of heaven, and He's going to be shining forth from inside of heaven. And, and so we, we, we can kind of, we can kind of a, a little bit think of a little bit like that, the, the, the brilliance of His glory. Uh, the foundation is made out of 12 precious gems. Um, now, so, some, of these, uh, some of these gems, these names ha have changed through the centuries. Everybody uh, with, with, with different languages and stuff like that, people call something, call it different here and there. But, uh, but we, we want to identify all 12 as John saw them. Um, and hopefully we can identify them a little bit in alphabetical order here. Amethyst, um, anybody know what color amethyst is? Purple. It's purple, right? Um, it's a purple gem. Beryl has a wide range of color. Um, it goes anywhere from emerald green to a, to a real golden yellow color. Um, it, it has a wide range. Chrysolite, um, it has, it's transparent gold with some yellow tones to it. Um, Chrysopersis, uh, <clears throat> that's a fun one, ranges from uh, yellow to emerald green. Emerald um, is, is the fourth one that John identifies. Jacinth is a deep red gem. Jasper, um, it's a mix of colors that are more in the brown family. Um, uh, Chalcedony ranges from uh, sky blue to, to soft pink and, and can can have translucent stripes um, through there. Sapphire is purple. Uh, sardius is uh, red. Sardonyx, uh, uh, parallel layers of red and white, and maybe some dark gray or black mixed into them. Topaz is either yellow or uh, sometimes teal. Um, the, these precious stones form the, the colors, if you will, of the foundation of heaven. Now, I, 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 I'm not a stone type person people ask me what my birthstone is I have no idea no clue nor do I care I'm going to walk around with a rock in my pocket telling people this is my birthstone what good will it do me it doesn't do me any good I, it doesn't I'm, it's just going to just going to be a rock in my pocket so <clears throat> so I don't I, I could care less doesn't matter I I have to shovel enough rocks. I don't, don't really care to be carrying them around in my pockets. Some people get really excited about all these different color rocks and stones and gems and everything. I, on earth, it has no appeal to me. Because I know that the, the greatest gem on earth is going to be like a piece of gravel when I get to heaven. So it has no appeal to me. Earthly gems mean zero to me because 
I could care less. I'm not, I am going to a place that has heavenly gems. And everything that this earth can make beautiful isn't going to compare to what God puts as a foundation. He calls it a foundation. That's good enough for me. If he's going to make a foundation out of some of the most beautiful gems, and the gems in heaven are going to be a lot cleaner than any gems on earth, and so if he's going to, if he's going to make sure that's, that's the foundation, why would I put much value on that on earth? I know you guys think I'm nuts, but seriously, I'm living for something a whole lot bigger. I'm not living for something that's, uh, that's foundation material. People say, oh, diamonds, you have to have diamonds. For, for what? Where I'm going, diamonds are part of the foundation. Is there value? Sure, there's value. Absolutely. There's value. In a life cycle. In a temporal world, there's value. What's it going to get me? Is it going to get me to heaven? Owning a bunch of jewels, is it going to get me to heaven? Not at all. It's foundational material. So if it's foundational material to God, how much value should I place on that over the value of a soul that the Lord said has far more value. The soul of mankind has far more value than all of the gems that we could possibly find on earth. And yet, when we try to make God a tabletop model, the gems of earth are going to matter a whole lot more to us in heaven. What a wonder. What a wonder. The, then the 12 gates, each gate made out of a single pearl. Um, now, pearls, <clears throat> most of us are aware, pearls are produced through pain. It's an irritant, right? Pearls are produced through an irritant. Um, most of the time, it's, you're, you're going to find a, a pearl. If you, can, if you can get to the center of it, you're going to find like a, like a grain of sand or something, something that irritated that oyster, something that was there, and that oyster couldn't function, so it, it, it started, to, started to secrete some kind of a fluid around that, and, um, and then it, it hardened and, uh, and, and gave it some relief, and then... Uh, it, it, they continued to make that, continued to coat that and coat that and coat that uh, until uh, what we call today, oh my goodness, it's a pearl. It's got such great value and awesome value. And, and uh, a few years back, I, uh, I, I broke my kneecap and <clears throat> went in after about six months because I didn't realize I broke my kneecap until about six months later, I, I had this little explosion in my knee. Sounded like somebody broke a stick. And uh, all I did is just twist it a little bit, and, and it felt like somebody, it sounded like somebody broke a stick, and it, it felt like somebody stabbed me with a, with a dagger right through the kneecap. And uh, I ended up about three days later, the pain wasn't going away. I went in, and I said, I, I, said, I got to see what's, what in the world's going on here. This hurts. So they did all their, you know, stuff, and, and they come back, and they said, you got to, you, you have a, he says, you you fractured your kneecap. Do you remember doing that? I said, no. He said, well, it's, it, it's, it's an old fracture. They said, uh, and um, what happened was there, and they showed me the pictures and stuff. They said, there's, a, there's this line right here that, that goes through your kneecap that, that, that tried to repair your kneecap and tried to, tried to fill that in. Well, there was a little void in there um, and uh, inside that, it's like a little gas pocket. And inside that little gas pocket were a couple of little bone chips. And that noise you heard 
was that gas pocket blew up. And it shot the bone chips into the, the tendon over here. I said, you mean I'm going to make a pearl? He didn't think it was funny. I thought it was funny. I said, I'm going to make a pearl now? He says, you have, you have bone chips in your, in your tendon. I said, yeah, I'm going to make a pearl. I said, it's irritating me, so now I'm going now, now to make a pearl, so in a year or two when you cut me open, I'll, I'll have a little pearl right there. He goes, he goes, this isn't funny. This is painful, right? I'm like, well, yeah, it's painful. Why do you think I'm here? Hello? Of course it's painful. What? He says, I can't operate on that. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a bigger problem if I operate. He says, yes, eventually you're not going to make a pearl, he says, but you're going you're gonna to build scar tissue around that. And, uh, and then it's going to, you know, hopefully it won't bother you for more than a year or two. Oh. A year or two of limping around. Fantastic. So, of course, I said, Lord, I don't want to limp around for a year or two. Can you maybe just heal this, you know, quickly? I don't want to be limping around, feeling like I, I got a knife cutting, sticking in my knee for a year or two. This this doesn't feel good. And and uh, and I was, I was walking around one night in church, and I realized something. I wasn't in pain. You know, I'm I'm dense. I'm I'm, I'm kind of one of these these dingbats that God will heal me, and it takes me a while to figure it out. I'm walking around and, 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 and I'm like, my knee doesn't hurt. What's going on? And then I, I couldn't remember the last time my knee did hurt. I'm like, boy, I'm so ungrateful. How can I be so ungrateful that, that the, you know, I prayed about this a few months ago, and I don't even remember the last time my knee hurt. And, and it just kind of dawned on me, walking around in the, in the sanctuary here, just kind of dawned on me that my knee wasn't hurting. And I was, I was like, Lord, how, thank you. How did I just absolutely forget about this? But that seems to be kind of a, a, a thing in my, my life that I'll pray about something and I'll forget about it. Some people keep praying about it 1,012 times and, they, and they, they can't function without thinking about it and how, how God's not doing this and God's not doing that because I've been praying about it forever, Lord. And, and, and there are some things that you, don't, you, know, you do pray about many times over, but, but I prayed about it and I, I, I honestly, I don't even think I was even that serious about praying about it. I just kind of said it in passing, like, Lord, it would, sure would be nice if you just healed that so I didn't, have to, I didn't have to deal with that for a year or a year and a half, like the doc says. And, and then I just went on my way and, and, and realized probably a month later, it was probably, probably was that long, that my knee wasn't even hurting at all. And then I felt ungrateful. How could I be so ungrateful that I, I didn't pause at the moment? You know, sometimes when you're healed, you know it. It's, that, it's just immediate. You know it. And other times you're healed and you don't know it. And something has to remind you. And, and uh, I felt pretty bad. And I thought, God, help me not to be so ungrateful. Because it surely isn't even close to a year and the pain is gone. And I'm walking around normal and, well, you know, <laughs> as normal as I can ever be. But, <clears throat> but an oyster develops that irritant and, or, or develops a, a, a coating around an irritant or a wound uh, sometimes. It begins a process of protecting itself against the pain by developing a protective layer of calcium carbonate. Uh, and, and then that crystallizes and, de and deposits a concentric layers and, 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 and builds a pearl. Well, j j for a moment, indulge me. The pearl is probably the highest value of if you want to call it a gemstone in heaven. 
out of all the rest of these things, all these gorgeous gems, those are a foundation. The pearl is the gate. Last week, we talked about how there's no pain there. All the pain has been covered by the pearl. So pain isn't entering heaven. And the pearl is a pretty good reminder that pain can't come in here. That all the pain and the suffering and everything that, that we deal with, we deal with on this side of heaven. When we get there to those pearly gates, there's no pain in there. The, the pearl reminds us, hey, the pain all belongs on this side because the pain isn't getting into there. And the, the, that is probably the most valuable of all the gems. The rest are just foundation stones. But that pearl just happens to be the gate that's an eternal reminder to the inhabitants of heaven that Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions and he took all the pain and all the suffering so that when we get to heaven, it's gone. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. The beauty of heaven is amazing. And I like that. I, I like how, you know, people, people talk about, they, they want to they wanna try to do all the beauty things here. That, and, it, and it's just so futile. That, I, don't, don't get me wrong. The Lord has made some incredible, beautiful things. But none of it compares. None of it compares to what we're going to have when we get there. Would you stand with me? I'm going to quit there for the day. You look bored. <clears throat> I'm not, but uh, I'm not bored at all. I like it. Yeah. I'm going here. Yeah. It doesn't bore me to talk about heaven. What bores me is when people make a bigger deal out of earth than they do out of heaven. What bores me is when people make a bigger deal out of a life cycle than they do eternity. That's what bores me, is when our problems, our, our problems become monsters that are so big that the wonder and the awe and the hope of heaven don't get any attention from us. The church is still going to heaven. Whether we go or not is up to us. But the church is still going. Can we make heaven a big deal again? 